Good evening. Very warm welcome to you all. I'm Jo Sharrick, Head of Shrewsbury High School. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our Women Mean Business events. Despite all the limitations that this pandemic has placed upon us, we are excited that by hosting these talks online, we can actually reach many more girls, many more families, many more alumni than ever before. So I'm really delighted that such high numbers have joined us here for tonight's event. And in particular, it's lovely to welcome so many girls from our sister schools across the GDST. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Now, the purpose of these Women Mean Business events is to raise aspiration and empower girls to head out into the world with confidence, with ambition and with an awareness of what to expect. And over the course of these talks, we hope to bring you women who mean business from all sorts of careers, disciplines and businesses to share with you their expertise, insights and experience. Now, tonight's talk, of course, focuses on women in the world of medicine, and we're very excited to be hosting a truly impressive and accomplished panel this evening. We welcome tonight five brilliant women from the field of medicine, each of them highly successful in their own chosen field. And we feel very privileged that they have given of their time, which is precious indeed, to share their experiences and their wisdom. Each of them has their own unique story and insight into what it means to be a woman in the medical business. And for the young women joining us here tonight who aspire to a career in medicine, this is the most fantastic opportunity to hear from those who are living that experience. So welcome to all of you. We're really looking forward to you sharing your experiences and offering advice to the young women who've joined us tonight. We're going to hear from each of our guests in turn and then save all of our questions up for a panel discussion at the end. If there are technical issues, please do bear with us. We have a superb team behind the scenes who will get us going again should anything go wrong. And so to business. I'd like to invite our first speaker, Miss Gillian Cribb, to share with us her experiences and her insight. Ms. Cribb is consultant orthopaedic and oncological surgeon at the Robert James and Agnes Hunt Orthopaedic Hospital. Ms. Cribb, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. It's really exciting to be here today. Certainly had nothing like this when I um, applied to do medicine and um, didn't really know anything about it. Um, so just wonder if you can um, share my screen, uh, my slides, Gemma. Fantastic. So that's me and my my long title, um, and I'll, I'll talk about what that um, is. And I work in a specialist orthopaedic hospital um, in Oswestry, which uh, for those people that are from, not from um, Shrewsbury High School is just um, north of. Um, Shrewsbury um, out in the fields really it's a bit unusual for a, a big specialist tertiary centre to be surrounded by fields but it means I can live and work in a really nice place so if we can go on to my next slide um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is my training and then what my job involves and then some perspectives about women in surgery um, so I did A-levels in biology, chemistry and maths. I also did A-level Russian, but realised after a year that really it was taking all my time. And if I wanted to do medicine, I did need to concentrate on what I needed to do to get in. So I went to Manchester University Medical School. I started, the date's wrong there, I started in 91, which I realised is 25, is um, is 30 years ago now. So it made me feel quite old doing this talk. So next Next. Um, so that gave me my first certificate. Um, and then really that's when it all starts, I'm afraid. Um, so medical school's the exciting bit and um, it really is lots of fun. You get to do lots of different things and try to work out what you want to do. Um, but then it doesn't stop there. So the first, um, so over 1996 to 2009, I had 25 different jobs, over 12 hospitals in two different countries. Um, so that's still all training. Um, but you start to get paid and it's a job. So everything was called different in my day. Um, and I was a house officer in medicine and surgery, which is the equivalent to an FY1 now. I then decided I wanted to do surgery and I really decided at the end of medical school and in my house jobs, because I really enjoyed it. There were lots of other things I enjoyed, but I enjoyed the surgery most. So then I did a basic surgical rotation, which was over two years. Um, and then at the end of that, it's really working out which bit of surgery you wanted to do. And orthopaedics was the bit that I enjoyed most. That took me on to doing a specialty registrar rotation in trauma and orthopaedics um, from 2001 to 2007. 
And then again, it's really homing down that specialism to work out what you want to do. And I really enjoyed orthopaedic oncology, which I'll talk about in a minute, and did a fellowship in Australia in 2008. The next, please. Um, so in this time to get from one stage to the next, a bit like doing your GCSEs and your A-levels and getting to medical school, you need to do various exams. So my first set of postgraduate exams was uh, my surgical exams in 1999, which at that point was four separate exams over two years. Next, which gave me my first certificate on the wall um, after graduating from medical school. And then the final exam, um, which is probably the hardest exam that I did uh, was in 2005. By then I was 32 and learning's a bit more difficult. And to add to things, I was 34 weeks pregnant, which um, made things even more difficult. At that point, it was three exams over two days. Next, please. Uh, which then gave me my NAS certificate. And eventually after 18 years of training, I became a consultant in 2009. Next, please. So why did I do orthopedics? Um, well, as I alluded to, I really enjoyed it um, and we make people better. It's really nice. They come in with maybe a broken bone. We do find out what's wrong, work out, get to the bottom of things, do an operation, which is the enjoyable bit as well. And then they um, leave hopefully uh, a lot better. Um, the quote um, up there is something I, I saw someone else had written and actually it rung true with me that people did tell me I wasn't strong enough. So I proved them wrong. It's good job security. People always break bones, I have a big diagnostic challenge. I get to play with lots of toys um, and there's nothing that smells or looks nasty. It's all very clean doing orthopedics. Next slide, please. So the oncology bit is um, is the real specialist bit. So I work in one of five bone tumour centres um, in England and Wales um, because we're so specialist. And really what it is, is lumps and bumps and funny shadows affecting the bones and soft tissues. Um, so these can be benign, so non-cancerous or cancerous tumours of the bone and soft tissues. What makes it interesting is it can occur in all ages throughout the skeleton, provides a big diagnostic challenge, but I am really privileged to work as part of a big multidisciplinary team. Um, and there's lots of different treatment options, um, which makes it interesting. Next, please. So in my job, what do I do? Um, so I've put the red bits as things that directly involve patients and the blue bits that not so much. So the traditional things that we do as um, doctors, as a consultant in a hospital is outpatients clinics. And in normal times, I do these in Oswestry, um, but also in Telford in Manchester. We have inpatients that we need to look after, so regular trips to the ward. And of course, being a surgeon, I have the operating. We talked about these MDTs or multidisciplinary team meetings. We don't act in isolation as doctors anymore. We act as we work as a big team. And in terms of each decision that we need to make, um, that will be done as a big team. So I've done one this afternoon with 20 patients. We've got another one tomorrow with 30 patients. Um, so there's a huge amount of discussion that goes into each patient's care. Next slide, please. So the other big bit of my job actually is not directly involved with patients. So I do a lot of teaching, um, both in terms of lectures, but also teaching prospective consultants how to operate and also have medical students and more junior doctors um, joining us. I do research, publish papers, um, things like this, promoting women in surgery, uh, write book chapters. I'm a reviewer for various journals, do various public engagement and charity work. And there's also the management um, side of my job. Next slide, please. So women in surgery. So there we are, she can do it. Um, but when we look at the numbers, it's still a little bit disappointing. So over 50% of UK graduates are female. But in terms of in surgery, it's only 12% of consultants are female. We do see high, um, higher uh, numbers in paediatric and plastic surgery. But in orthopaedics, the number of consultants in the country is disappointingly low. It's still 6.7%. But what's reassuring is that overall in the country, 19% of registrars, um, they're the ones training to be orthopaedic surgeons are female. And in our unit, actually 25% are registrars. But I was the only cons uh, female consultant orthopaedic surgeon in my hospital of, of around 50 consultants for a good amount of time. I'm pleased to say there's three of us now. Next, please. So why is this? Why are there barriers for women in going in, or into orthopaedics? Well, really, one is a lack of role models. So you really need to see one to be one. And I was lucky at the very beginning of my training that I had um, female role models. So I thought it was completely normal. And it wasn't actually until I came to Shropshire that I realised that it's not the same everywhere. 
We still encounter a lot of unconscious bias. I'm not recognised often as by staff and patients as being a surgeon. I still get letters addressed to me as Mr. Crib, um, assuming that surgeons are male. Um, it makes me laugh a little bit because I'm not sure what my dad's going to do about it because he wouldn't be able to, he doesn't do medicine. So we get addressed often as mail in collective emails, dear sirs, and exclusion from social events um, that can be predominantly ma um, male oriented in terms of the invitations. We get assumptions that if you go as a couple to a surgical event that your husband's the surgeon rather than yourself. And also the assumption if you're female that you trained and work part time, which I didn't. There are assumptions that discourage females from going into orthopedics. It's thought to be an uncontrollable and busy lifestyle. Well, actually, most jobs are often uncontrollable and busy. It's not just um, surgery and the necessity for strength. We do need strength, but actually it's the technique. But there was all, also an overwhelming sense that you need to be as, comp as competent as men, that you need to show that you're more capable. Um, however, we have moved on quite a bit from um, Henry VIII's quote in 1540, so I'm pleased to say that. Next, please. So we're supported by like, literature that we can be female and um, operate on patients and treat patients. And actually, um, female surgeons' patients are 4% less likely to die um, or be readmitted following the surgery. Um, overall, in terms of female physicians, you see lower death rates, um, readmission. And fem uh, favourable female attributes um, are ten particularly tendency to adhere to guidelines when treating patients. We do as we're told, generally. But also the ability to communicate, engage with patients, um, which ensures their compliance and our adeptness at collaborating with colleagues. Next, please. So overall, in terms of women in surgery, um, I like to promote myself as a role model, um, give our trainees an identity, I provide a support network for them and spend um, a lot of time promoting and championing women, women in surgery and um, highlighting bias. Next, please. So overall, keep on going clicking until it finishes clicking. Overall, it is a challenge um, balancing your work life um, and your home life, um, but it's needed to um, ensure that you've got a well-rounded lifestyle. Um, so I've got two children. I've always worked full time, as I said, and it's it's a balance um, to work out what works well for you. Um, but overall, I'm delighted that I chose to be a surgeon. Um, it's an absolute privilege to do the job um, and to see my patients get better after their surgery is um, really rewarding. So I'd recommend it to anyone that thinks that they may want to do this. Thank you. Gillian, thank you so much. Um, that was really inspirational and also very honest and, and has given us a, a fantastic insight to the journey that you've been on, but also the, the, the journey that some of our future medics might expect. So I'm sure that our audience are buzzing with questions. So if there are immediate questions, do post them now, but we will come to them at the end once we've heard um, from each of our speakers. So I'd now like to welcome um, Dr. Sophie Schachter, who is consultant anaesthetist, also at the RJAH Orthopaedic Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and thank you for asking me to be involved this evening. A, a real pleasure. Um, to speak to um, such a, a large group of girls who are enthusiastic about um, medicine. So um, Gemma, I'm actually going to share my screen if that's all right, and then I can click on. Is that OK? Has that worked? I'm not sure it quite has, Sophie. We 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 don't have your screen. We had it before. Oh, I thought. Sorry, I thought that was um. Your. I thought that it was. It might be just yes, behind yes. that screen. So we can see it now. It's just it's not presenting as a slideshow, but we can see the slides. Right ready okay so as um uh, as you know i'm uh, also uh, a consultant at the orthopedic hospital where jill is a surgeon um and uh, i'm actually a consultant anaesthetist so slightly different role to jill but we work very closely together 
um, and I'm going to give you a potted history of um, my journey to this point, um, which is slightly different to Jill's, but um, nonetheless um, interesting. OK, so my journey, um, uh, where, what has been my journey so far? So my journey started not so far away, actually, at um, a secondary school over the border in Wales called Lambuthlin, and that was where I had my secondary education. I did my A-levels, um, similar to Jill, actually, chemistry, biology, maths, and I also did a language I did French, which um, soon got downgraded to AS level because I needed to con concentrate on the other subjects. Um, I then um, had a bit of a um, tumultuous journey to medical school because I didn't get where I wanted to originally. And for me, that's a really um, uh, a positive um, outcome in the end because my, my journey was very different to the one that I had planned. But it started to build resilience within me and uh, and I realised that medicine was really what I wanted to do. So um, that was my first stumbling block. Um, it's not always playing sailing girls, but um, we can get there. Um, I spent five years at medical school in London, so King's College in London, which then became Guy's, King's and St Thomas's. Um, and I completed my first year as a doctor in 2002. Um, uh, amongst some of the bigger training hospitals in London. I then decided it was time to um, spread my wings and I went to Australia. So very fortunate in medicine, um, you can travel the world. Um, so I went to Sydney and worked at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, um, which was a fantastic year. Um, it coincided with the Rugby World Cup and England winning the Rugby World Cup, of which we managed to get tickets. So a very fond year uh, of memories, that one. Um, during that time, I worked in a very large intensive care unit at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, which was a 50 bed intensive care unit. And this is where my passion for anaesthesia um, really started. I came back from Australia and moved to the um, to the south coast, um, to Brighton. Um, uh, which um, yeah, I'm sure you're all familiar with Brighton Pier and I lived there for six years where I completed, um, started my anaesthetic training and um, uh, travelling around many of the hospitals around the south coast. I then um, went to, um, to London, so back to Guy's where my medical training started. Um, Guy's Tower is the one on the left next to the Shard. Um, and um, uh, that was my penultimate year before I gained my um, consultant certificate. Um, that was a great opportunity to go and work in some of the, the great teaching hospitals in London again, but now as a more senior trainee. Um, and then um, I came back to, um, to Shropshire, so um, back to where it all started. And interestingly, um, when at the age of 15, I did some work experience at the um, orthopaedic and uh, in my 30s, I then ended up there as a consultant. I don't think I would have predicted that at the age of 15, but isn't it funny how life works out? Um, so as with Jill, many years of training, exams um, and um, night shifts, hard work. So 17 years, I think, in total between starting medical school and um, uh, gaining my consultant job. So um, I think that's something that I really wasn't aware of when I applied to medical school, of, of what a long journey it is of, of uh, exams, training, um, before you, you come off the conveyor belt at the end. Um, so, anaesthetists, what do we do? It, interesting, many people, if you ask the public, don't actually uh, know that anaesthetists are doctors, but I think anaesthetists secretly quite like that. We quite like being in the background, quietly getting on with things. And our role very much um, is looking after patients um, during operations and procedures, so it's very um, science-based, very physiological. We're trying to maintain normal physiology of the human body while um, clever people like Jill um, do the operating. Um, so anaesthetics, anaesthesia, we're the largest specialty group of doctors in the NHS. Um, uh, it's huge and we cover not just looking after people in theatre, but an awful um, varied range of practice. Um, and there's a large number of subspecialties. And all of these you you get the opportunity to experience during, during your training, which I feel um, 
very privileged to have um, to have done. A few more of us are female, um, and I'll, I'll um, allude to why I think that is later on. But um, in a survey done a few years ago, about 35% of anaesthetists were female. So, as I said, we we provide general anaesthesia for people undergoing operations and procedures. But we also do other things. We do pre-operative assessments, so we get to have uh, detailed chats um, in a pre-operative clinic setting, but also our pre-operative visits prior to the operation. And this, for me, is a really key moment because you are looking after uh, someone at probably one of the most um, daunting times of their lives, and they're expecting you as the anaesthetist to take good care of them and wake them up at the end. So for me, that's a really important part of my job is to build those relationships and that confidence and trust in patients in that small 10 minute window that you get before an operation. During training, we also experience the emergency department. So um, we're always there as anaesthetists in um, to look after critically ill patients and stabilise them prior to transfer either to the intensive care unit, to the ward or out to another hospital. So lots going on at that time. You need to keep your cool um, and but also you need to be heard. We also get involved in obstetric anaesthesia, so that's delivering babies, so pain relief for labour, but also helping um, uh, pain relief to enable babies to be delivered um, by caesarean section while the mum is awake. Intensive care, we've seen lots of pictures of intensive care recently with COVID. Um, it's uh, as by nature of its description, it's a very intensive environment. Um, it's um, very sick patients, but as an anaesthetist, it's um, it's a, a very exciting environment. Things can change very quickly and you need to react to those things and you need to be able to communicate well with your multidisciplinary team um, at that time. Anaesthetics also involves rehab on the roadside. So there's people that do pre-hospital medicine. So they go fly out to the scene with air, the air ambulance crew and resuscitate people at the roadside. And um, we're also involved in transfer of critically ill patients uh, between hospitals. So lots, lots and lots of different options um, to subspecialise within anaesthetics, but you get exposure to all of this during your training. So what's the other stuff? So that's my training, but um, that's not just what it's about. So for me, um, being a doctor has enabled me to to travel the world. So um, you can go and work um, in, in many places. Um, medicine uh, and being a doctor is not just about treating the patients, but it's also developing your own interests. So as with Jill, I have um, a great passion for teaching and I've been fortunate enough to gain further qualifications in teaching which has been supported in some of the training roles I've done. Um, I um, We get involved with teaching medical students, nursing students but also the multidisciplinary team that we work in so we have lots of communication with different members of the team. I also have a passion around um, something called human factors, which is appreciating that we are all only human and mistakes will happen. But how can we design systems to minimise those mistakes? So I've been able to develop that role at Oswestry, which is which has been great. And that leads on to another role um, that I uh, have just been appointed to in patient safety. So a patient safety specialist. Um, so you can see there's lots of opportunity to do um, to do to do different um, things other than just the day-to-day -day, uh, anaesthetics for pe people having operations. Anaesthetics, I think one of the reasons that it's it's popular with, um, with females is because there's, it's very flexible and there's a, a great opportunity to go part-time, which I did take advantage of during those 17 years. I did have two years out um, to, to have my family. But for me also, um, my career presently is part time because that allows me to do the things that I want to do um, with my family, which um, it's back to the work life balance, as Jill said, and the things that that make you tick and make you happy. So um, I feel very privileged to, to be a doctor. I love my job as an anaesthetist. I feel very lucky that I have lots of options to to specialise in different areas. And um, yeah, I 
I can't say I would do anything different if I had my time again. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Um, so inspirational and so exciting to hear of, 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 a, of a very different route but that you, but you have both found yourself you know working side by side um, some really exciting things for us to pick up on um, when we reach the end of our discussion um, it makes me want to retrain it's so exciting um, I'm probably too old though now sadly so anyway I'm delighted now to welcome Dr Alice O'Connor who is consultant um, in palliative medicine at Seven Hospice and a former pupil of Shrewsbury High. Dr Alice, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's true. I am a former pupil. Um, I wonder if you've got my slides, Gemma. Yeah, I'll sort them for you now. Thank you very much. Um, I was at the high school from, I think, 1990 to 1998. Um, and and I swore I'd never come back to Shropshire. And here I am, a bit like Sophie. <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't like Shropshire. I just thought there might be more exciting places out there. Right, so I'm going to give the same talk that Jill and Sophie have given. Um, uh, and that's the title slide. So next one, please. Uh, I've said that and the best thing about the high school was the amazing teachers. I did science, English and German and um, German, it's interesting, all of us have done languages. I really enjoyed the mix in my A-levels, so I did quite a few um, and I loved everyone uh, and I did lots of music as well. Uh, next slide please. Um, I was thinking about UCAS forms and I was thinking about you and applying for medicine um, and the things I've put up are things that I thought about that that might be helpful for you. I'm sure you know a lot of them. Um, extracurricular, so orchestras, sports, whatever you can prove, Duke of Edinburgh, um, these things are all fantastic fun and they will put you high on a list for an interview for medical school. Um, the bit in the middle there is about volunteering. So you can volunteer at nursing homes or at the hospice if you want. There's lots of hospices around the country. They've all got voluntary schemes for medical students or people who want to be medical students. Um, I did a, a voluntary placement in a, in a nursing home and it was fantastic just taking cups of tea round, helping, and you get to see the sorts of problems that people have. It's useful. Um, I also did work experience in the local hospital and the picture on the bottom right is cataract surgery. I watched an entire morning of cataract surgery and it was magical. These people who came in and they couldn't see because the lens in their eye had become cloudy and they literally just cut out the lens and put in a new one. Um, and, and that, I mean, that is magic, isn't it? At the top I've put newspapers because I think it's very important if you're applying for medicine um, and you're thinking about interviews to be up to date with what's happening in the world. There's a lot of medical topics that come up again and again in our newspapers. Um, so think about those things. Uh, next slide, please. So why medicine? And why, why you? Why should they pick you? So I've put what is your USP? What is your unique selling point? Um, think about why you want to do it and have a really clear answer. Try not to say you want to help people because the panel will probably think, oh yeah, everybody wants to help people. Why do you really want to do medicine? Um, think laterally and while you're thinking, talk. So talk through your thoughts before you give your full answer. I had I had a lot of interviews for medical schools around the country and I remember Nottingham sent out a pre interview questionnaire and they had the question in it. What do you spend most time doing out of school? And you had to tick a box and it was do you watch telly the most? Do you read lots of books? Do you go on walks? And um, I was honest and I ticked that I watched telly most when I was outside of school, um, but I didn't get an interview. So perhaps don't be always be completely honest. Um, I've put at the bottom medical ethics. So these are very good questions that you could easily be asked at interview. Um, and it goes along with the newspapers, really. If you're keeping up to date with stories in the newspaper, then you will have a bit of an idea and a bit of a thought process around um, common topics that come up in medical ethics. 
things that you might see, um, question I had at, at interview, would it ever be the right thing to reduce or remove feeding from someone who is unable to talk for themselves? Um, now that's a very, very big question, um, but it's something that you'd want to be able to have thought about before you end up in interview having to answer it. Uh, thank you. Next question. I mean, next slide. <laughs> So why do I think medicine is the best career in the world? And I really genuinely do. Um, and I think Jill and Sophie have alluded to it already. There's such a wide range of possibilities. You can go from hand surgery or orthopedics like Jill through anaesthetics. You can see at the top there heart surgery, radiology, which is x-ray interpretation, um, down to the bottom, which is public health. And I've put Public Health England because we're all very aware of Public Health England at the moment. But medical degrees lead to so many different careers. Um, yeah, thank you. Next slide. So medical school is tough and you need to know that um, we had lectures all week pretty much nine till five every day and on Saturday. None of my friends that did English and history had that. Um, exams do never end and you'll have seen that from Sophie and Jill's slides. Um, we as doctors have taken exams into our 20s and 30s. Um, I managed to fit a history of art degree somewhere in the middle there. I went to Cambridge first and then did my clinical um, studies in London. So um, that was a really positive thing and there are lots of opportunity to have time out, work flexibly and train flexibly. Uh, but yeah, it is a lot of work, um, but you have friends for life. And at the end, I've put more exams because there literally are. Uh, that's a picture of Keele Medical School where I work um, one one sort of half day a week as a, as a tutor. Thank you. Uh, junior doctor. Um, <laughs> it, it's tough, really tough nights and weekends and late shifts and while you're there a lot of work um, but as you'll see from this picture of lovely shiny Wolverhampton everybody is incredibly friendly the nurses the therapists the staff on the wards um, it's a brilliant job as Jill said in her talk uh, doctors are no longer this revered person who comes along and makes all, all the decisions. We definitely work collaboratively within teams. And again, that adds a lot, I think, to our day to day working. Thank you. Next. So I qualified um, 2004. I did my clinical work in London. I specialised four years later, so came up to the West Midlands after working in London for, for several years. Had a baby in 2009, became a consultant in 2012, and I was appointed at the local hospice in Shropshire about eight years ago now. And I had another baby after I became a consultant. Uh, and that is a picture of some of the people that I work with at the Seven Hospice in, in Shrewsbury. Um, the brilliant thing about palliative medicine, and I'll talk a bit about it, is that it crosses all areas. So it, it, it couldn't be further away, really, from what um, Jill and Sophie do. Uh, we, we're, we're quite generally spread. So you can work within the hospice, you can work at home um, with, with people at, in their homes, and you can work within the hospital. Um, and it really does spread into every area of life. I know that Jill said that everybody breaks bones, but really, honestly, everybody does die. Next slide, please. So what is palliative care? I think I tried to find a really good picture and it's difficult. Um, and I might do my own version of this, but I would have the patient and the person at the centre of this. So the person is at the centre of this with their family very closely aligned to them. And what we try and do is look at anybody who has a, a serious life limiting illness and to help them to live as well as they possibly can. And we work with general practitioners and district nurses, um, secondary care physicians within the hospitals um, to try and enable people um, to live well, I suppose. Um, 
within the hospice and at home, some of the people that we look after do die um, and we we work with them and the local teams to help make this as easy as it can possibly be and as gentle and supported um, and and just really as a normal part of life. Um, I quite like the skull and crossbones at the top there. We don't shy away from dying uh, in the same way that everybody is born into this world. We're, we're, all, we're all just on the way out at the end of our lives. Thank you. Next slide. So this is a quote to end on from Cicely Saunders, who was the doctor who set up the hospice movement. Um, it's a it's a British born um, speciality, palliative medicine, uh, and it's something that I think we can be proud of. The hospice movement within the UK is is world renowned. So she said that you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. And that's exactly right. Um, one of the patients that I saw this week in clinic said to me that I'm only going to die on one day and for every other day I'm living. And he, he's absolutely right. And that's what Cicely Saunders was saying. Um, so that is really the essence of palliative care. Thank you. I think that's my last slide. I'm hoping it is. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. That was um, really moving, actually. I think this year we've all had to perhaps confront um, our relationship with death and it being on the news day in, day out is something we're not used to. Um, that was that was really moving. Thank you very much. You. I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Annabelle McCann to speak next. She is consultant respiratory physician and RCP tutor at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital. Welcome, Annabelle. Thank, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Um, can you hear me, Joe? Thank yeah, you. Can and hear you. Uh, hopefully, Gemma's got some slides for me, just a few slides of um, some photos that I thought might entertain. <laughs> so, when we just start with the title one first, Gemma, if that's okay. Thank you. So, so thank you to Ms. Sherrick and um, Mrs. Parrish for inviting me to contribute to this event. Um, it's really brilliant to be contributing um, and connecting with other GDST schools as well. Um, and um, I should declare my interest. Um, like Alice, I'm a GDST girl um, and um, I'm also the daughter of a GDST girl, the sister of two GDST girls and the mother of another two GDST girls. Um, and when I started at medical school um, at the University of Edinburgh, um, I ended up with another three GDST girls, all from different schools, as my flatmates. Um, first slide, please, um, Gemma. Um, so here I am on the left um, with, with one of these um, fabulous girls in our first year. And um, just to say that this is how 19-year-olds dressed for an evening out in the 1990s. Um, but whether GDST or not, um, I, have, I have studied and worked with some incredible women in medicine. And I have drawn inspiration and strength from so many of them. Um, as I think we've heard already this evening, a medical career truly is a journey and can take so many different routes. Um, but in every specialty, in every hospital where I have worked, I have met successful women. Here I am with my work sister, Emma, in the autumn of 2019, when all we had to worry about was promoting the flu vaccine. Uh, next slide, please, Gemma. Thank you. I spoke to some of these women when preparing for this evening, and I'm always struck, I think, as, as has been very clear this evening, by the variety of medical careers and the specialist interests that, um, that uh, we can pursue. Um, there's an absolutely enormous range of medical careers available, and having made the decision to study medicine, it does literally open up a world of possibilities. Um, I looked back at our house officer cohort from 2002 last night, and other than noticing the astonishing range of ties and white coats that infection control, control would never now allow, I can see friends who have worked all over the world and in every specialty you could think of. In my own career, um, I did become interested in respiratory medicine at, a, at quite an early stage, um, but the nature of medical training, I think as we've already heard, is such that I had the opportunity to work in an incredibly diverse range of specialties in a total of 13 different hospitals on my route to become a respiratory physician. 
Um, I was fortunate to train in Edinburgh and to start my career in this beautiful Victorian hospital um, that was the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. And um, here's my daughter, Alicia, um, visiting with me um, just before the pandemic. Um, sadly, now it's converted to luxury flats and no doctor can afford to buy one. As a senior house officer, um, I rotated um, between Edinburgh and Fife um, in Scotland. And I had at one stage a beautiful commute over the Forth Road Bridge to a small friendly hospital there. Um, but in Edinburgh, back at the, um, at the major teaching hospital, I worked in medical admissions. I worked in toxicology, which is a pretty busy uh, specialty in Scotland. Uh, renal medicine, cardiology and elderly care. In those days, there were fewer female consultants, and I remember sort of each one specifically. Um, but the tide was turning with some fantastic female registrars coming through in every specialty. In my surgical house job, there had been no female consultants. But a few years ago, I was thrilled when I heard that our female registrar from that time had been appointed to be Professor of Transplant Surgery in Edinburgh. Um, I think this experience is reflected throughout the profession. Women are increasing in number, but more importantly, are taking up more senior positions. There is some way to go. Um, too often I, I've been reflecting that I've conducted a ward round with my team and I've seen the confusion on my patient's face when the small female doctor has introduced herself as the consultant. I'm usually Annabelle or at best Dr Annabelle with the ward or clinic staff and I don't think they even know the names of um, some of my male colleagues. But I like to think that this reflects my approachability and a collaborative style rather than any sexism. What my patients should realise, and I think we've heard this already this evening, is that they are less likely to be interrupted by a female clinician. They'll be listened to for longer and they may receive more cost effective and patient centred care. Indeed, research has shown, as we've already seen, that having a female doctor is associated with a lower risk of readmission to hospital and indeed of death. A great enabler has been the growing flexibility of medical training um, and the opportunities to work part time across all disciplines. Um, after three years of working in Scotland, I moved back to London and I had some challenging but eventually rewarding experiences. Um, and similar to Sophie, I worked in intensive care and at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, I worked at St Thomas's where Boris Johnson was to be a patient some 14 years later. I then started my registrar training in respiratory medicine. Um, and four years in, I had my first baby daughter and we um, and our family moved to Shropshire. Um, after my maternity leave, I was able to resume my training on a less than full time basis. And I have maintained that working pattern ever since, or at least until the pandemic came along. But as we emerge from the ordeal of the past year, I do foresee even greater flexibility um, for us working in medicine. I can now check my patients x-rays in my kitchen. I can attend meetings when I'm not um, actually there in person at work and I can keep up with national, international conferences without traveling and, and leaving my family. And that also applies to my husband. Um, third slide, please, Gemma. So I wanted to mention in closing the Edinburgh Seven. These were the first women to study medicine at any British university. They matriculated in 1869, but were denied access to teaching. They were sabotaged, a sheep was sent in, and they were rejected four years later. But in 2019, they received posthumous medical degrees represented by these seven female medical students. And I think this was a recognition of the courage and the strength and fortitude and the talent of women studying medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And, and what a positive and encouraging message that things are changing um, and that, you know, but, but I think how wonderful for the Edinburgh Seven, but, but how wonderful that you five are here with us because you have obviously trailblazed um, and part of the reason that it is getting easier is because of the work that, that, that you women have done. It's really marvellous and how brilliant to hear the GDST turning out quite so many medics. Delighted. <laughs> so anyway, last but far from least, I would like to welcome Dr Evelyn Evans. She is a higher training doctor in forensic psychiatry at Tyne and Weir. Welcome. Hello, hi everyone. Um, uh, I haven't got any slides for you this evening, um, which is actually making me feel a bit conscious that my face is going to be so large on the screen. <laughs> Perhaps I should have uh, uh, sort of made some up, but I thought it was probably a better idea just to sort of talk to you about my experience um, as a, a sort of woman in medicine. Um, Mrs Parrish very kindly asked me to come. Um, she was my teacher at Bishop Heber High School. Um, I grew up in Whitchurch. 
and um, I'm from a family of uh, medics. Uh, both my grandparents were doctors and my grandmother was the first woman to graduate with her twin in England. So she and my great um, aunt graduated together from Liverpool Medical School um, just before the Second World War. Um, so there's quite a lot of pressure in my family to be a doctor. And I was always described as kind of a bright child. And I did very well at my GCSEs without really putting in any effort. But that kind of made me complacent, if I'm honest. And when it came to doing my A-levels, when I had a car and I could conceivably go out drinking, um, I'm afraid I started to shift my priorities and I had a little bit too much fun and didn't do quite enough work. So um, I did A-levels in biology, chemistry and physics. Um, I did do French as an AS level. And um, I think one of the lessons I learned looking back is to really do the thing that you enjoy. I felt at the time that doing biology, chemistry and physics would look good to the universities, but I was awful at physics. I was awful at maths um, and I was actually quite good at French. So perhaps things would have turned out differently had I picked French. But I think that's a lesson that I've learned that you should do what you like, what you enjoy um, and think less about what will look good to other people. Um, so having been brought down a peg or two with my less than shining A-levels, um, I went through clearing to get into university and um, I was left with a, a sort of a choice where I didn't really know what to do. And um, I decided, well, what I do like to do is raise people up, people's eyebrows. I always like to do something which is slightly unexpected. And so I elected to do a tropical disease biology at the School of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool, uh, which is the only undergraduate degree like that. Um, and I had the most wonderful time. I met people from all over the world, from sort of Brazil to Southeast Asia, sort of, it was just the most fantastic um, experience. And Bill Gates had donated a lot of uh, money to the school. So there was a big shiny new high tech lab. Um, and uh, I had a brilliant time. I, I got first class degree and I graduated at the top of my year, which was um, really nice. They gave me a 50 quid prize for that one. Um, and I was offered a PhD. I was quite tempted by it, but I'm not a very patient person. Um, and I like people a little bit too much to spend my time doing kind of gel electrophoresis and staring at tables. So I thought, what should I do? Shall I have another look at medicine? In order to do that, I needed to get some stuff on my CV that would help me to, um, well, first of all, help me to look good, but also give me a better idea of what working in healthcare was actually like, because I hadn't really done very much of it. So I decided to go and work um, for a company who provided um, personal carers for people with spinal injuries. So I worked for about a year, just over a year, looking after um, people who'd had um, traumatic injuries um, which had affected their spinal cord and, and left them um, well uh, quadriplegic the most of the people that I worked with. Um, that was an amazing year it really was eye-opening and it made me very grateful for all the privileges that I've had and um, it gave me an insight into what it's like to be a patient I think and to be a, a long-term patient of a really impactful um, physical health issue. Um, so after that, I decided I would do medicine and I applied. Uh, I got offers from Oxford and Liverpool and I decided to go back to Liverpool. Um, it was a more modern course and I had friends there and I liked it. So I decided to, to do what I liked, not what I thought would look good. Um, so I um, started graduate entry medicine in 2010. So that's a slightly shortened course. Um, so they squeeze together the first two years because you've got a kind of background in biological sciences. Um, and I was actually part of the first year um, or cohort in Liverpool that was the majority girls. So I think this is, I was part of the turning of the tide, I think, which um, all the other consultants have spoken about so far. Um, there I uh, didn't really know what type of medicine to do as a medical student and eventually I stumbled across a psychiatry summer school and the thing that caught my eye here was the opportunity to go to Ashworth Hospital which is just outside Liverpool and that's a high secure forensic psychiatry hospital um, and it's the kind of place where they uh, would care for Ian Brady who's a very high profile murderer that you might have heard of. Um, I went there and I met lots of doctors and lots of very unwell, rather dangerous people. And I thought, gosh, this is a bit eyebrow raising. This sounds quite fun. Um, 
I ended up doing some special study modules at university and um, then uh, went on after I'd graduated uh, and did some extra special study modules as a foundation doctor. So one of the great things you can do as a doctor, if you haven't got quite the jobs that you want, is you can use some of your educational time to go and get that experience in the in the speciality of a particular interest in. Um, and so when I got to do some forensics as a foundation doctor, I met um, some lovely forensic consultants and they got me involved in research um, and interventions in my trust, which reduce violence and aggression. Um, so reducing the incidence of patients and staff being harmed. Um, so I got to present at an international conference on reducing violence in psychiatry um, in Dublin um, in 2017. Um, that was a really fantastic experience. Um, I sort of created a poster. I spoke on a big stage. It was terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time. Um, and I continue to do that work with the consultant I met as a foundation doctor, who's actually my clinical supervisor at the moment. Um, during psychiatry, I had a really wide range of experience. So you can um, do lots of different types of psychiatry. Um, forensic psychiatry is, is, is just one and I'll explain a little bit about it in a minute really. Um, before I talk more about my special speciality, um, I do some other things in the northeast. So um, I work as part of a thing called Find Your Place, which is encouraging um, junior doctors to do more training in the northeast. Um, and I'm setting up a psychiatry summer school to uh, encourage medical students to um, become psychiatrists, just as I was inspired myself. Um, and uh, I do quite a lot of teaching with medical students as well. I haven't taken an academic um, route in my higher training, um, but my trust is very um, active with teaching because I think we've got about four medical schools now. We've got Sunderland as well, so we're absolutely stuffed full of medical students. Um, it's great fun. So uh, doing forensics, I started um, just in August, so I'm halfway through my first job. Um, I'm working in a low secure unit and that low secure unit takes gentlemen um, from medium secure units, which are slightly more secure, as the name might um, suggest. Uh, we take people from prison as well. And we also take people who pose significant risks who are coming up from general adult services. Um, what we do is um, sort of intensive psychological interventions. We do offence based treatments and um, we look at sort of medical treatments for their mental health illness, say so things like antidepressants and antipsychotics and things like that. Um, over the course of uh, my uh, higher training and my core training in psychiatry, I've worked with doctors from all over the world. Um, so I was just making a list earlier on um, and it's it's ridiculous. Um, so I've got people from Romania and Hungary, Canada, Egypt. Um, my One of my friends is from Syria. There are quite a few Nigerians working with me at the moment. Um, there's doctors from India and South Africa and Venezuela. Um, it's, it's a brilliant speciality to be in. Um, I suppose as a woman in um, medicine and in psychiatry, um, I, I would agree with the women who've spoken before me that it's been really um, fantastic to work with women that I've worked with. They've been such strong and inspiring women um, and it's good to know that there's going to be more of them in the future. Um, I've done six jobs as a foundation doctor and I had one consultant as my um, supervisor and out of the six jobs I did as a core training psychiatry doctor there was only one out of six that was a woman <laughs> so it, it we are underrepresented in the higher levels of medicine but the reassuring thing is that I work in cohorts of junior doctors, which are almost entirely female. Um, in the last six months, in fact, uh, myself as the registrar and all the um, SHOs that I was working with, we were all girls. And um, we used to make fun of the consultants because we were outnumbering them being, being mostly women in the junior positions. Um, I think that um, becoming a doctor as a woman is, um, uh, it's a fantastic career choice, um, especially as a psychiatrist. There's a really good work life balance and there's an awful lot of support around. I think um, out of all the medical specialities, um, we're a bit soft. <laughs> we like talking about our feelings and, um, and we like to make sure that we're all looked after. Um, I think there's quite a sorority of um, 
of, of the consultants, the female consultants that I've met, um, all the ones I've worked with, um, I am actually really good friends with as well. Um, and that's a lovely work environment to be in. Um, I'm going to finish my little talk about myself with a plug of, of a little book um, which people might have heard of. So um, it's An Unquiet Mind. Um, it's written by Dr uh, Kay Jameson and she's actually um, a professor of psychiatry at I think it's John Hopkins. It is John Hopkins University and um, she has bipolar affective disorder herself and um, this book is really one of the most inspiring and interesting um, books about mental health written by someone who has a mental health issue and is also a psychiatrist. Um, I would love to meet uh, Kay, I think she's a fantastic woman and um, if only we could have gotten her to give a presentation this evening. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Maybe next time, although who needs her when we have you five? I think it's been amazing and um, thank you so much to all of you um, for being so candid, for, for giving us such insight, for being willing to share your very different routes into this amazing career and I think that's the thing that has come across for me is how much you all love what you do. Um, none of you have shied away from the fact that it is incredibly tough, it was tough to get there and it's still tough to do it but you love what you do. And, and that is incredibly inspiring um, to young women who want to follow in your footsteps. So I'm going to open the floor to questions. If you could post them in the chat, um, that's probably the easiest way. And then I'll try and filter them through um, to the panel so that we can um, get you some answers. Whilst we're sort of, whilst you're thinking of what your question might be, I think one of the questions I'd like to sort of kick us off with, it's really clear that, that all of you have have referenced that women are underrepresented in medicine. It's getting better, but there's some way to go. Should that should that put our young women off? It, it, is is this going to be just too hard? And 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 sort of you know should should they look elsewhere? What advice would you give them? I don't know. Do you, um, Jill? Do you want to start us off with that one? Um, yeah, so I think I'm a good example to start with because I'm in a very male career and it's never stopped me um, and it's sort of inspired me more to do it. Um, and, you know, I was told at school that, oh, you can't do medicine because it's too hard. And then I'm told you can't do orthopedics till it's too hard. So that just fires me up to want to do it more. So, um, no, I definitely don't think it should stop people. Um, as we've seen, there's lots of different things you can do in medicine so um, you don't need to be doing big heavy stuff like me um, you can do different stuff you can balance it with your lifestyle and you can change what you do you can start doing one thing and if you don't like it and it's not right you can change so um, I definitely don't think the low numbers of women should stop people wanting to do it. Brilliant thank you. Annabelle do you want to chip in? Yes, I mean, I think what's interesting actually is that as, as at starting at medical school, the numbers tend to be pretty equitable and they were even um, when I started. Um, I think what we see is that um, over the years that that there is some um, some sort of attrition and and also that um, there has been a perception that certain um, careers were more um, perhaps uh, friendly towards women or were more compatible with family life or, or uh, part time working. But I think it's increasingly clear and I think what we've seen tonight is that it's possible to um, to have a, any kind of medical career and and work flexibly or work less than full time or whatever's required really to stay in medicine. So I would really encourage, um, you know, girls thinking about studying medicine to um, to 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 go for it. Um, but then also I think what we need to do sort of in higher up in the profession is, is look so, so that we retain our females and you know, as Evelyn has said, she's she's got a large number of, of, of female juniors on her team. We want to keep those um, keep those females in medicine and see them progress all the way through. Thank you. Does anyone else, Sophie, do you want to add, add to that? How do we keep them? Um, I, I think that's being um, about us being role models and us demonstrating um, uh, behaviours and um, professionalism that that um, those below us aspire to and I can certainly remember uh, female um, role models in my training and I, I still think about them now and I still think how would they have handled it 
And I think, yeah, it's about us as as the as females inspiring those juniors and being role role models for them. Brilliant, thank you, Alice. I think I would say that men are different to women, women are different to men and we have strengths that men don't have um, and medicine needs a female outlook as well as a male outlook. I think within palliative medicine and the hospice world there are many many more women than men um, and that's interesting as well isn't it? It's a bit like within nursing there are many many more women than men but we don't bemoan the fact that there aren't enough male nurses. So I think what I want to say is a bit of what Evelyn said, which is do what you what you love and do what you want to do and don't be put off by your gender, but equally um, be be happy with what you're doing, I suppose. Um, yeah. Brilliant. It's very woolly, woolly, wasn't it? <laughs> Not at all, not at all. Evelyn, do you want to add anything? I'm conscious. I'll try and mix up the order we come round to everyone in. So, yeah, I was going to say, it's, you're stealing my my line being woolly. That's the psychiatrist's territory. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I think probably what I'm um, what I would say is I've just I've just become a forensic psychiatrist. I've just did my application and um, this time last year. And this is it, psychiatry is generally more female orientated. There's lots more female doctors, but forensics is is generally still very male. Um, and one of the things I had to do was rate myself on like a self rating scale as part of my application. And so I did this thinking, oh, gosh, what, what how should I rate myself? And I took it to one of my male consultants who marked me up on nearly every single score, said, no, look, you're, you've, you've done more than that. No, you're talking yourself down. And I think that's one of the things that boys do less, especially, you know, boys at medical school. They talk themselves down less. I think girls tend to be more modest. Um, and so when it comes to sort of fighting against the other medical students or or the other junior doctors for that place for that um that spot at the bedside or for what, whatever reason i think sometimes girls are are less fiery and being competitive um, and we should stamp that out be fiery <laughs> you make sure that you talk yourself up and um don't don't sort of be that kind of demure wallflower make sure that you're um you know making yourself heard Absolutely. By the way, if anyone wants to chip in as you're listening to each other, please do. Don't feel you have to sort of wait for the invite. It's a really interesting point, Evelyn, isn't it? I think it's something that, that we at schools talk about a lot. You know, how at what point do we start preparing women actually to, to be bold and to and to not undersell themselves? Um, you know, it, it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, Annabelle, you mentioned um, the first name basis and people perhaps feeling that they can be more familiar with a, with a female doctor, which is at both a strength, but also perhaps sometimes is that galling? Oh, oh certainly. I mean, I think there is this kind of, yeah, there, there is a sense that perhaps this is sort of an everyday sexism. Um, but so I, I, I try and view, like a lot of things, I think um, in, in medicine, that, you know, I think you have to try and turn things around and view them more positively, because otherwise I think all these little things can 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 get you down. And so um, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've tried to view it as a, as a good thing, and it means that, um, that you know, I've, I'm approachable and things, and hopefully that makes me a better, better doctor and a better colleague. I think one of the things that comes across when you're all speaking as well is that at points in your career, you obviously had some very, very good advice or some very, very good mentors. Um, is anyone sort of, you know, was there somebody who said something to you at a particular moment that made you? pursue your dream or, or perhaps you know one of the things that some of the questions are very interested in is how you chose your speciality for example what, what was it that led you to make those choices and you've all done such different things so um sophie i know you touched on this but was there a moment or a mentor that led you into your speciality so i don't know whether the other ladies on the call agree but some people would say that the specialty chooses you rather than the other way around and and definitely i think um different specialties suit different personalities. Um, uh, for me, I think um, I was approached by an anaesthetist who said you'd be a really good anaesthetist. And from that point on, I sort of started um, exploring anaesthetics more because in medical school, you don't really get much exposure to anaesthetics and intensive care. So for me, I really had to start um, making my own inquiries, I suppose, to see whether I did 
think it was for me and it became fairly obvious that that it was it suited my personality shall we say um uh, but I do remember when I did my um house jobs that I had a GP trainee uh, trainer who said to me you're great as a GP but please go and run an intensive care unit somewhere this isn't enough for you and so I think from that moment onwards uh she sparked yeah the thought processes so yeah that's brilliant fantastic does anybody else want to share yeah I think, I think some, sometimes it's a chance thing that you get um I failed my surgical finals in my fourth year so I had to do extra surgery in my fifth year um and orthopedics found me so I got an attachment where half the team were off for one reason or another so as a medical student I was getting to play and it was it was by coincidence really having failed the exam that I got that opportunity so um, and it was just it's just what you enjoy it's all so hard and so long and if you don't love what you do it's this it's too hard anybody else I think that's very true it's coincidence isn't it and and lucky happen chance I was a medical trainee um, at a busy hospital and the thing that I cared about most was the patient's life and their family and how this illness was was impacting them. I did I did care about their blood results and what the fracture showed or what the x-ray showed, whether they had a fracture, but I cared more about their career and where they'd spent their childhood. And um, I think that that meant that I wanted to do something slightly off the side of medicine. So that's how I ended up in palliative medicine. Brilliant. Any other comments before we move on to the next question? Lovely. OK, so we've had a number of questions um, really around um, the sort of perhaps the trauma and the, the scale of what you do dealing with with death and, and bereavement and, and perhaps things going wrong. Um, so I, I guess what I think what the, 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 the guests would like to hear is how you deal with a traumatic experience at work and how perhaps you keep it at work and protect your own sort of mental health in, in dealing with these things. Um, Evelyn, do you want to perhaps kick us off? Um, yeah, so I think the traumatic things that happened to me at work are probably quite different to the things that happened to some of the other doctors that you're speaking to today. Um, in psychiatry, some quite traumatic things can happen um, and I've got to say that there is extremely sort of strong support systems um, for nurses and junior doctors and you know senior doctors um, to deal with the fallout for that and um, as psychiatrists as well as part of our training we do um, like psychotherapy so there are groups that we take um, anonymized patient sort of cases to um, and discuss those within a peer group um, it's kind of facilitated by a psychotherapist and you all talk about your feelings and how the patient might be feeling and how you might be feeling and the the ramifications of that situation on everybody involved and thinking about that and reflecting on that can help you to um to move on from it and to learn from it um i think medicine has an an unescapable traumatic element to it um and it's actually the people around you who help you to deal with that and it is your good female role models your consultants who have probably had a similar experience as a junior doctor who stand by your side and listen to you and um and make you feel um sort of secure and um understood and valued as part of that team who else would like to chip in Gillian, do to yeah i mean i think um certainly in in my line of surgery, because I deal with patients with um, big tumours, life threatening tumours and it's big surgery that um, we do have complications um, and our patients do die. Um, and it's very much that Evelyn said it's having our support network around us, um, the team that we work with, but also um, much of the work Sophie does is the learning from when things go wrong. So how if something does go wrong, what was the cause of it, but not blaming people learning from it so that we can improve so it doesn't happen next time. Um, so th the NHS has moved on a lot, I think, in my career that we'd, we've now moved on to learning from events rather than a blame or or trying to hide them a bit, maybe. 
Thank you. Annabelle? Just jump in. Sorry, there was something that Gillian just said there, and it's something that um, I suppose one of the things that you think, oh, why do I need to do the D of E? Why do I need to have all these extracurricular activities to be a doctor? I just need to be clever. And I think part of that is because you need those activities outside your life to keep that normality and to be able to sort of switch off from something nasty that's happened at work, you know, going out walking the dog or d doing whatever it is, climbing, doing whatever it is that you love. Sorry, I've got to... No, I think, I think I think that's very true. I mean, I think I think it goes with the territory, um, and it it doesn't stop, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's equally upsetting um, now as it was eighteen years ago when when you know something goes wrong. Um, so it is, as, as I think the question sort of suggests, it is a question of 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 dealing with it and perhaps um, reflecting, and then and then taking taking the experience and taking the learning and and using it to sort of move forward. Um, and I think um, it, you know it's always hard, and so so you know the support of colleagues and talking something through with someone who's you know inevitably had a similar experience or can you know can help you work work through um, you know is 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 absolutely key. And I think particularly, um, I think one of the things that's been so noticeable in the last year is how, you know, even the most experienced and senior clinicians have have had, um, you know, particularly obviously in, in, in my line of work and in, in intensive care and things, have had, a, you know, a, a horrendous time. And um, I think the silver lining to that cloud is perhaps that, um, you know, there is better recognition now um, amongst colleagues and amongst our trusts and our and our, um, you know, and our support networks that 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 this um, is a really important aspect and that, you know, certainly sort of um, psychological support and things is is really coming to the fore. And and I think I'm hoping that that will continue, you know, beyond the pandemic. Yeah, I hope so. It's one of those things, isn't it, that you hope it, it, that there seems to have been a big uh, appreciation and realisation and we don't want that to just disappear as things go back to normal um, it's really important that we hold on to those lessons isn't it mm -hmm. Sophie do you do you want to add anything on that point before I think we, if we come to Alice at the end on this um uh not really I echo what what the other speakers have said it, it it's it's hard it's particularly hard in the beginning um that first day on the ward as a junior doctor you've gone from from the lecture theatre or whatever uh, and suddenly you're a doctor and it, it's very different having shadowed doctors on the ward to then suddenly your name being on the drug chart um or you know in the notes um and so yes it it's hard uh, but it, as Annabelle said, it's equally hard now. I think for me, what's really important is the support of of the, of the team, of colleagues, um, having a supportive environment where you can talk to people and you can you can share worries or concerns and you can learn from each other. Um, and it's it's stopping, it's checking that someone's okay because what you might be okay that day, they're not. And vice versa, it might it might come back to you one day. So it's having time, communication, being aware of of, of everyone around you, and and having the support of your colleagues. Yeah, absolutely, Alice. I, I've sort of left you to the end, perhaps because we've had a few questions specifically related to why you you chose the that you know the route that the, the specialism yeah. that, that you do have, and obviously, in one sense, dealing with with knowing that you're going to be dealing with trauma. There's there's no there's no debate for you, is there? But what I would say is the deaths that I deal with are often not trauma. They are expected deaths and death as a normal part of our lives. Um, and so I would say that death isn't always a, as a result of a mistake or a problem or an accident. It is something that is natural. And if it's approached in that way, then it causes less trauma to everybody involved. If it's planned for and communicated in the right sort of way, then that is what we would aim for. Now, obviously, that doesn't apply to people who are very unwell with COVID at the moment and dying before, before their time, if you like. Um, and that is very traumatic. And when things do go wrong in medicine, it, it's really distressing. And I would echo everything that everybody has said. But death itself doesn't necessarily have to be traumatic and wrong and a, a complication. Um, death is a big part of what we do in hospitals um, and in GP surgeries around the country. Um, yeah. Do you, do you feel that you're prepared for that at university or is that something um, that... <laughs> no, okay. 
<laughs> no, that, death that is a failure. Death is taught as a failure. I think it's I think it's getting better. Um, and a part of my role in Keel is about communication skills and working with medical students. Medical students now are a lot better at it. They've clearly had more training than we ever did. Um, but you, all you're taught when I, when I was at medical school is how to keep people alive. Um, and human beings can't stay alive forever. So, yeah. <laughs> There's lots of nods from your colleagues there. <laughs> we asked that question, but it's good to hear that perhaps it is something that, that, that you know, at the point of study, people are, are thinking about how they can at least, I don't think anything could ever prepare you for actually that first day on the job, Sophie, as you described it, but I, I guess it's a start to at least confront some of these issues, isn't it? So I don't know if we could change tack slightly because we're getting um, a lot of questions about university um, and, and really, I suppose you all talked about work life balance once you were qualified or once you'd picked your specialism. But there are questions around um, how at university you balance the demands of a medical degree whilst everyone else is seemingly not doing that much work. Um, and, and whether there's sort of, you know, we, we have a very specific question. We have, a, we have a young lady who is interested in sport and rugby as well as medicine. You know, she's worried that she'll be disadvantaged if she tries to maintain her academic life a long time her sporting alongside her sporting life so I don't know if anyone's got any advice for for managing that at university um obviously I've got to say one of the best doctors I know is also one of the best rugby players I know and she she's an absolute wonder um and working in New Zealand I'm very happy now so you know I think um that kind of sport is brilliant for you it's absolutely perfect and um doing it as we said will actually help with the work-life balance it will help with stress um, and you know you will have enough time to do your work the there, there comes a point where it's too much um and so yeah I, I couldn't encourage her enough to to continue to to do that um it can be easy as a medical student to compare yourself to other people all the time um and I think I was quite conscious to try to not do that um and uh, my own experience as a medical student I did the graduate entry medicine so um I was already a bit older um, and I had had that opportunity to have the slightly, well, no Saturday lectures for a start when I did my other degree. Um, so I suppose that's a, another thing that I would say, if you think if you thinking about being a doctor and, and you're not sure, don't feel the pressure to have to do it now. There are other routes into medicine other than going straight in from sixth form and they can help you to become more rounded people in 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 the long term. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I, I think it's certainly possible to combine medical school with whatever your interest is. Um, and there's lots of people that carry on sport or music or whatever it is, a high level. Um, my motto throughout was to work hard and play hard. And I really did both. And it's getting that balance that I did lots of sport. I did lots of going out. I maximised my time at university. Um, so it's life doesn't stop when you go to medical school. It's you can balance it. And certainly if you're a high level athlete, um, the medical schools will balance it against your uh, if you're an elite athlete against what your requirements are. And we had people in our year that did that. So. Don't let it put you off. <laughs> Annabelle. Yeah, I think I'd say on a very positive note, it's, it's huge fun going to medical school. Um, you know, I, I've made absolutely lifelong, deep kind of friends there. And, um, you know, the, the sense of kind of camaraderie, um, you know, when, you know, perhaps the perhaps the English or history students have gone home, but we're up for another week. But then, you know, you'd have a huge party at the end, you know, and and, you know, it, I look back so fondly, actually, on, on those years. Um, it was hard and um, but then, you know, you weren't alone and we were all sitting our exams together and, you know, we, we, we got through it together. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be put off. And I mean, if you're if you're studying and working, um, you know, for, for A levels and things, you know, this is, you know, it, it's not it's not hugely different. You know, you've you, you've you've just got to, um, you know, you've just got to um, just keep going, really, and, and just, get, you know, get ready for the exams when they come along, but also enjoy enjoy the time off and enjoy, you know, and enjoy your your, you know, your holidays and things when, when you get them. So I, I think I think it's not to not to be feared. Brilliant. Really encouraging. So any, anything that anyone else wants to add on that before we move on? Um, what I will say about sport is that's an 
also an excellent opportunity to meet people outside of medicine because medicine is very all consuming. And when you're in lectures Monday to Friday or even Saturday, nine to five, your world does revolve around medics. And um, as much as I love medics, it's quite nice to meet <laughs> other people. So um, I would absolutely advocate doing what other interests you have because it will broaden your horizons um, equally. Yeah. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, I mean, I guess I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's what, what the, the strong point that's coming across is that you can absolutely work really hard, prepare very well, do very well, but still have a life and have fun alongside it. Um, it doesn't have to require um, undue sacrifice by the sound of it, which is great. Um, however, we did talk, I think you all, a lot of you touched on um flexibility and and career breaks and you know whether you did or didn't have children and whether that was sort of um was it ever something you had to think about in light of will that affect my career or was it always easy to to think well career motherhood I'm not I'm not going to be asked to choose would anyone like to kick us off on on that I think the NHS is one of the best employers for flexible training. Um, it's, I mean, we employ more people in the Red Army, don't we? I think that's something I've read somewhere. Um, and because it's so large, there are so many different sorts of people who need different ways of, te of learning and, and training and throughout your junior doctor years, but definitely as you become a senior registrar and consultant, then flexible training is very, very possible. Um, and career breaks, you can go abroad, you can work um, wherever you want, really. Uh, and people do come back to medicine after a year, two years out. Um, yes, I, I think um, if you choose medicine, then you choose a very a, a, a work that can fit to your life. Honestly, I do. Um, yeah. If I compare myself to friends from university who did other degrees and are working in different sectors, they find it much more difficult to work less than full time and flexibly and still achieve. Is that something the rest of you would echo? Yeah, I mean, I think from I've always been full time, but I had my children when I got my consultant job. And certainly when you're a consultant in my job, I've got a lot of flexibility on my day. Um, so if there's a school concert, I know that I can make my clinic finish earlier because I'll do more on another day so I can make that school concert. Um, so it's just about being organised, um, but it's still possible even to have a full be full time and be able to balance it with all the things you want. And that, that's not the same for every speciality. Um, I can plan my operating list so that I know I'm going to leave on time, whereas Sophie's a bit stuck with what the surgeons decided they want to do that day. So if they, if they don't want to get home, <laughs> they'll have a long list and Sophie's stuck there. But certainly, um, as Alice said, we, we are, do have the privilege of lots of flexibility um, and taking maternity leave is a normal thing. Um, and it's slotted into my training just fine and it, it didn't hold me back um, and it's nice it's nice to have that break. Brilliant. Anyone else? I, I don't know what everyone else's experiences um, were but I, th I think it is fair to say that there are sort of easier and sort of less easy times to have your family. Um, I think I have um, sort of supervised trainees who've maybe started a family, you know, in their sort of house officer or, or junior or, or senior house officer years. And um, just the nature of rotors and um, the effect of, of working less than full time on the duration of training and of rotors ha has been noticeable. I think for me, having got most of my training under my belt as a, as a full time um, a registrar before um, pausing to ha have my family did make things a, a little easier for me. I mean, doing night shifts and things when you get into your mid thirties is 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 not easy. So I was happy that I'd got most of them done before I had my family. Um, but obviously, you know, it, it you know that it, it's impossible to plan these things. But I think it is just something that might be worth you know bearing in mind if 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 you are considering these sorts of aspects. Thank you. Sophie, do you want to? Um, no, I mean, I echo what Annabelle said, actually. I, I very much, um, as life worked out, children were, were later um, f for us. Um, 
and I did look back at trainees who were trying to go through exams with children and I just thought my gosh how do you do it um, so yeah I think um, as much as there are ways around these things I think sometimes life in medicine shift work exams all of those things life is complicated as it is sometimes it, yeah maybe throwing in the extra extra curveball yeah if, if if you can plan yeah it's probably better <laughs> but equally yeah <laughs> I think you made the, the point yeah. Sophie in your talk didn't you about life sort of working out in, in unforeseen ways sometimes <laughs> we're not absolutely <laughs> can't always stick to the plan but there are actually there are a few questions Sophie whilst whilst you have the floor around um how you take medicine overseas that's generated quite a lot of interest how you know it's how how do you actually do that um yes so again I think I think what you'll get from from this evening is a lot of what happens in medicine is is opportunity <laughs> and um and but meeting the right people at the right time and networking and, and that is one of the powers of medicine it, it's um there's a lot to be gained from networking but um for for me I um very was very lucky I slotted into a job that one of my colleagues had done the year before so um, the the hospital that I went to in Sydney part of their contract was um, was providing uh, doctors for the outback hospitals and none of the Aussies themselves wanted to go there they wanted to stay in the big shiny hospitals in the big cities um, so the way they got the pommies over was um, was they give them a good job in in the big teaching hospital as long as they go to the outback for three months um, so um, it was it was really following up on contacts of a friend who who then um, teed up the job. So I think it, it's the contacts you make while you're training. You'll have people that that you'll you'll know will be ahead of you that will go and do a job somewhere. You'll hear about it and you'll think, oh, I like the sound of that. You'll get a contact and and it'll all work out. But there's fantastic opportunities to work overseas, even, you know, um, not just as a as a junior doctor, but as a senior doctor. So, you know, um, fellowships um, in, in orthopaedics, a lot of fellowships are overseas. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of opportunity to travel. And that's um, that's, I think, a real positive for medicine. Thank you. Does anyone have anything specifically to add on the travel question? Otherwise, um, we've got we've had uh, a just just Sorry. to say my I did my fellowship. I did a year in Australia and um, it was probably the best bit of my whole career. Ne don't regret it um, one <laughs> bit. <laughs> I'm not sure why we came back, but. Um, <laughs> the lure uh, but, of Shropshire, I think. Yeah. It, it was, very... if, I don't get, if I don't get a job in Oswestry, we're going back and well, I got my job, so. <laughs> That's, <fine. laughs> That's brilliant. Although it has, you know, it's notable that of those of you that, that, that were from Shrewsbury or, or, or the Shropshire area have, have been drawn back to it. It's obviously just a <laughs> lovely part of the world. Um, so I've got had a good question um, from from a student who she wants to know if you halfway you know into your career um, decide to change your area of medicine, how easy would that be to do? Is the first question. So I don't know if anyone's happy to volunteer. And there is a, there is a, there is a follow up. But how easy would it be to do if you wanted to change your area of medicine? Who would like to? Um, I could do it. I've, I've got quite a few colleagues that have decided orthopaedics, it's not for them um, at various points of their career. So certainly in terms of when you're in senior training, some people have finished their training and then gone out of medicine to industry. Um, and equally others that the start of their career and just, at the start of being a registrar, they've really worked out that it's not right for them. And I've had two trainees in the last couple of years that have done that. And one's transferred out to genital urinary medicine and once transferred out to um, general medicine because he wants to go out into public health so it's certainly something and there's just no point if staying what you're doing if you don't like it um, I think we've probably made that point so certainly my experience of my trainees that have transferred is that it's been perfectly possible brilliant is that everyone's experience that it should be so then Annabelle is it 
I mean, I, I think absolutely. I think um, there are some moves that are easier than others because I think you you need to look carefully at the at the jobs that you've already done, and then what what which of those is useful on the training path to whichever specialty or whichever area you want to go into. So certainly, I've had um, you know trainees who have moved into you know from medicine into radiology, or from you know from from um, uh, medicine into general practice, or um, you know, and and then they've been able to use quite a lot of their um, previous experience to take them forward um, but I think probably sort of making a change from what I do to what Gillian does you know might be a bit more challenging so it, 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 it does vary. <laughs> so that that's the follow-up question if you had to swap specialism tomorrow <laughs> what would you choose that's what that's what one of our, our guests would like to know what specialism Evelyn, Evelyn why don't you start us off what would be your alternative? Um, well, I almost did A and E, so I think I would probably be um, be an A and E. Uh, I really loved um, the kind of sort of I like the sharp end of things. I like people being poorly psychiatrically or otherwise. <laughs> um, so uh, I I did enjoy my time in A and E, and I like that kind of wham bam, thank you, ma'am, of sorting them out and getting the next one on. It gave you a great job satisfaction, um, and it does make you kind of feel like a bit of a hero. So. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, Alice? I would go into general practice. Um, I think GPs are the biggest group of doctors in our country and they are completely amazing. They, I don't know how they do what they do, but I would be very interested to learn how they do what they do. They balance and juggle and hold so many people um, who are can be variably unwell at different times and they know them intimately and they often I mean I think this probably used to happen more but they do still keep people in in their care from from cradle to grave um, so I think GPs are the bedrock of our medical um, services and and I would love to learn how to be one. Brilliant thank you Jill. Um, I would do palliative care. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Very. Uh, and, and why? Uh, um, I think, well, although I'm an orthopaedic surgeon, I am at the touchy feely end of um, orthopaedic surgery. So I do a lot of work with um, patients with palliative illnesses. And Alice and I do a, a clinic together. or We used to in, in normal times. And so, you know, there's a lot of bone pain associated with um, palliative care and there's a lot of crossover between our specialties so I'll be knocking on your door Alice when I can't operate anymore. <laughs> Annabelle? Um, I, I did think quite seriously about radiology so sort of looking at x-rays and CT scans and um, you know th that sort of thing but um, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that I liked talking to patients and doing ward rounds so it didn't seem like the right career for me. Um, I think palliative care would have been um, something that I would have, th have thought about had it, it been a stronger sort of, had there been a stronger representation, I think, perhaps during my training. Um, mm. And um, and I think also, I think, um, you know, I, I, I would have probably give a different answer pre and post pandemic because choosing respiratory medicine when I chose it um, seems, you know, seems very different from, you know, dealing with a global pandemic. So I think, uh, you know. <laughs> I think um, it's it's not something I expected to happen in in, in my career, so um, so oh. that's changed things a little bit. But no, I'm I'm pretty happy with what I with with what I chose. <laughs> Brilliant. And Sophie. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think I'd just um I think I'd be a vet actually. I think I'd leave medicine. <laughs> <and be a> vet. <laughs> Brilliant. There's nobody quite like an anaesthetist. <laughs> Well, one of the questions was, what what would you do if you weren't a doctor? So, you know, we, we know. Does anyone else have an, a totally alternative career that they pondered and have always wondered about? Um, I would have before um, the sort of pandemic and home learning, I, I would have said being a teacher. So I certainly <laughs> <laughs> I certainly realise um, how different it is teaching. Um, sort of well my my son that's in year seven compared to my registrars it's it's definitely <laughs> a different level <laughs> yeah I would have said teacher too Jill I think teachers and doctors we're very very lucky you get such good interaction with people don't you and and every day is different that's the other joy of education and and medicine but 
I am also a terrible homeschooler. So, you know. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions actually, but bringing it back to school while we're on it, um, around A-level choices, which actually is something you all touched on. Um, and, and I know it's difficult because that's the university sort of decide the route as to what students must study. Which, what, what advice would you give to somebody who is, you know, in year 11 at that point of, of weighing things up? They might want to be a medic. They're not sure. They love their French. Languages came up a lot. What, what advice would you give to somebody about their A-level choices? Annabelle, would you be happy to start us off? I, I think it's a question of sort of knowing and understanding yourself really um, and, and your cap capabilities. Um, I, I, I was really keen on, on applying for medical school um, and I absolutely loved history. It was, um, you know, probably my favourite subject, certainly up until GCSE. Um, and um, I considered, you know, uh, trying to attempt to, to do that alongside science subjects and things. And I just felt I probably, you, you know, wasn't clever enough and would spread myself too thinly and might miss out on, on medicine. Um, but equally, I think we've heard from from um, uh, women this evening who've who've done brilliantly in their A levels with a with a breadth of choices. So I think a realistic appraisal, actually, of of, of where you are, how sure you are that you want to read medicine, um, and um, you know what your priorities are, and and other subjects, languages, history, English, you know, they can remain very much with you. Um, it's just that perhaps um, for me, anyway, sitting an A level in in one of those subjects would have been maybe a bit too much. Do you, do you feel as a group that there is one A-level that with hindsight you couldn't have done without? Or were they all more about getting to medical school than... than... I think you have to do chemistry, yes. but again, that's an entry requirement. Um, I don't think you needed any of the science A-levels particularly. And a lot of the students that I meet at Keele have done um, complete arts degrees and then come into Keele to do a medical degree. Um, so I think the the landscape of medical training is changing, um, and and I know that if you're going to jump straight into it at 18, you do need chemistry and one other science, I think. Um, but Evelyn's yeah. nodding her head. I'm going well, to well, some medical schools <laughs> yeah. are now saying they don't want chemistry, aren't they? So, so I think that that's beginning to happen. Yeah, yeah. That, that some medical schools are broadening it. Sorry, Evelyn, I yeah, I, I think you. I just I definitely had the this idea that when I was in sixth form that that doing like all the sciences or sciences and maths was the the only way that I was gonna get in, and I think that was like ultimately very flawed. And I would have done better choosing a couple of sciences and actually, like like Annabelle was saying, knowing yourself, knowing that maths is not my strong point and it never will be. And um, I should have played to my strengths at that point in time and said, I'm reasonable at chemistry. I'm good at biology. I should pick something else that I'm good at and that I enjoy, you know, not something that I hate and I'm bad at <laughs> and I'm going to struggle on, you know. Um, and then as well, I, you know, as I said, I came in through a graduate entry route. So I met then lots of people who'd done lots of different things over different time periods. Um, and, you know, uh, medicine's a broad church. You know, it's absolutely fine to be a more mature junior doctor. Um, it, you know, it's not a it's not a problem. And actually, sometimes um, being a little bit older and a little bit more worldly wise when you are a foundation doctor can be that that edge and help you to to sort of master that work life balance and and look after yourself a bit better. Um, so it doesn't always have to be your A levels and straight to medicine. You can do other things and think about it before you you know take the plunge. Yeah, and absolutely. someone did ask as well, sorry, about the debt for students. So luckily, when I did graduate medicine, um, there was a four year course and I only had to pay for one year of university fees um, because the rest was subsidised by the NHS. So look out for for, call, for sort of uh, programmes like that, which can help you if you're looking at long time at, at university. Yeah, I guess, I mean, there is a sort of, um, because there is a shortage, isn't there? And I think there are there are changes afoot. One of our students has just posted in the chat that um, they found 11 medical schools that will, will accept their subject choices at A-level and they didn't take chemistry. So what, what do you think is causing that change? Is it is it a, an acceptance that the job is different or perhaps is it is it necessity? I think it's just a, a wider realisation that 
we before were very traditional you need the sciences but actually you didn't need this you didn't need to know anything about chemistry at all it was <laughs> that people thought that that was the breadth of knowledge and those application of skills is what you needed so and I think now it's much more accepted that it it's not the case I mean certainly um, chemistry a level everyone wants it you never use it at all at university um, I can't even do my daughter's GCSE chemis chemistry now so I mean it was an utter waste of time really and I got an A in it did really well really liked it so I think it is the realization that there's different skills that are needed um, and I think in terms of what the choose sort of getting back to the choosing it's worth looking if you're in year 11 whatever, looking at the different medical I think have we lost have we lost Jill there I think we have hopefully she'll come back to us shortly um, I think that's really encouraging for students to hear because I think for so long medicine has felt closed off to some people because they weren't brilliant chemists but actually you know quite clearly that, that that's no longer a barrier um, there there's a very good question here um, which I missed earlier on and, and the, 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 they've asked it again um, how long would it take to become a professor in medicine oh Gillian are you back we lost you there briefly sorry <laughs> Um, so a professor in medicine is a consultant who is part of a medical school and has published research and is a is a is a trainer within that university as well. Um, uh, there isn't an answer to that. I know that um, you've got a professor in your department, Jill, haven't you? We've got a yes. professor at the, at the at the hospice at the moment. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, More there's than different, 15 different years, groups. I think, probably from medical school, probably, but um, variable. It, I, I think it depends where. So if you have an honorary chair, um, which is someone's awarded it to you because you work hard and you've got the right papers, but then there's also a chair that you apply to. Um, so you could potentially apply to that as your first consultant job if it's an academic chair with it. So it's it's very variable and just be wary with people got professor before the name. It means various different things because it may not be sort of the big chair of the big university. It may be an honorary um, thing that's been given. So um, it's really very variable. Thank you. And then I think we've just got time possibly for one more question. Um, it's a very practical question and, and I think one that we probably will empathise with. We, how at the moment with everything going on with the pandemic, do you have any suggestions of volunteering that aspiring medics could actually take part in? And if they can't take part in it because of what's going on, um, do you think that will prevent them from getting a place at medical school? Um, I think I think they're all in the same boat. I think the one thing to say is they're all in the same boat a little bit. So um, they're all going to be compared with everyone else. Um, we certainly we've got nursing students, lots and lots of nursing students back on the floor in Ossestry, but we haven't got work experience students yet. And I presume that's the same elsewhere. So it doesn't really answer your question, but just to allay people's fears that everyone's in the same boat, really. Um, yeah. And it's looking for those other opportunities. There's lots of webinars and everything at the moment. Um, so if you can't actually get the hands on the patients to see what different ways that you can get that experience, because there's new ways of getting different types of experience. Lovely. And then one last question um, that somebody asked quite at the beginning. What advice would you give to somebody who is wavering? They think medicine might be for them, but they're not sure. Um, would you say go for it or not? Sophie, put you on the spot. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's different answers to this. My, my comment would be if you're not sure, wait. Um, do something um you know have a have a year out or do another degree as Evelyn did you know um there's lots of lots of other options but medicine uh, as you've heard from all of us it, it's it's hard and you've got to really want to do it um to continue um the training not just at medical school but afterwards so I think if you're wavering take some time out you've got a long road ahead just to be sure that when you do choose it it is what you want to do Thank you. Annabelle, would you agree? I would agree. I think um, if you'd asked me maybe 10, 20 years ago, I would have said go for it because we just didn't have the same sort of graduate entry and we didn't have the same um, routes into medical school as we have now. 
Um, there were literally no graduates on my course. There were a couple of dentists who were training to be maxillofacial surgeons, but apart from that, it, it just wasn't it just wasn't possible. Um, so I would have said, you know, go for it because otherwise you might not have a chance. But I think now, um, you know, as everyone has said, and as you can see for yourself, it, it, it's a long slog. And so if it's not what you desperately want, I think it's going to, you know, it could be very hard to to stay motivated. So. Um, we've we've got some fantastic graduate, um, you know, medical students and and trainees. So, um, you know, do do look look at a different degree, I think, and um, you, you'll need to work hard because it's competitive, you know, at graduate entry. But um, I think I think look at look at other options. Anything else anyone wants to add, or does that cover it? Uh, or just to say, my consultant colleague at the end of med at the end of school, she didn't know whether she wanted to do medicine or not, so she trained to be a diagnostic radiographer. So she gave radiotherapy, but actually, she realised that um, it was really medicine that she wanted to do. It does come to you. If that's what you really want to do. You'll you'll go to it, um, and you know you wouldn't know any difference now. She started being a consultant a bit older, but our consultant lives now. If you're appointed in your mid 30s, normally we're going on till we're 67. So there's no problem padding it out with an extra five or 10 years at the beginning. So it's never too late. Never too late. <laughs> <laughs> so we um, thank you to um, somebody has posted some wonderful links in the chat to virtual work experience opportunities. So thank you very much for that. I think it's one of our lovely colleagues from HALS. Um, I guess I'd just like to invite, if, if you want to, a final comment from each of you. Um, we, we have run out of time. It's been amazing. Um, but if there is any final words you would like to say, don't feel you have to. But if there's anything you wanted to get across that you haven't, um, does anyone have a final a final word for our, our guests tonight? And who would like to kick us off? Just I'd just say to do what you love, um, do what you're interested in, what makes you happy, um, and, and don't take a subject or do a degree because of um, other people or any other way you want to be perceived. Just make yourself happy. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks. Says the yeah. psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn, you're right. And I think medicine is one of those degrees. If you're bright at school, people say, oh, you could do medicine. But it is a massive thing to commit to, um, especially at 18. So if you're worried, then listen to Sophie and and think about having some years thinking about it yeah but it is the best job in the world um i'd, I'd sort of do the flip side of that i was told by lots of people why i shouldn't be doing it and why i couldn't do it so if it's something that you do want to do don't listen to those people and do what you want to do brilliant annabelle well i think just to wish everyone it luck um, and also to say that, um, you know, if, if you've been studying through this pandemic and you've been managing virtual school and, you know, things, then you really can handle anything because um, I think you've had a much harder time than than we certainly did um, at, at your age. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, hopefully things will improve and you'll be able to get out and, and, and get to pursue the career that you choose. That's lovely. Thank you, Sophie. Um, yeah, medicine is a privilege and uh, we spend so much of our lives working. It, if if you do think medicine is for you, you will absolutely love it. It's an absolute privilege. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, it has been an absolute privilege to hear from the five of you. Um, I, I think I speak for everyone when I say it has been incredibly inspiring, hugely helpful, lots of practical tips a real sense of, of what to expect, what to look forward to. Um, it's clearly not an easy path, but it is also, it comes across from each of you, such a fulfilling, exciting and varied career. And one that we, we want to keep seeing those numbers of women going up. Um, we really, really do. So my heartfelt thanks on behalf of everyone. The, the chat is going mad with thank yous. I hope you can hear the pings. That's what they all are. They're all thank yous. Um, what I would just say as a, as a sort of final um, word, I do hope that tonight has been useful to you. I do hope that if you are able to, you will join us for some of our future events. We have a Biomed conference on Saturday the 13th of March, which is an event bright. Um, so do join us for that. And our next Women Mean Business event will be focusing on um, those women who've chosen to go into the law in its various different forms. Um, and finally, if you're not already a member of one of our lovely GDST schools and you'd be keen to find out more, um, our virtual whole school open day is on Thursday, the 18th of March. 
As always, we would love your feedback, um, so please do pop it in the chat. A lot of you already had. It's lovely to see or drop us a line. And a final word of thanks um, to the woman who made this all possible, the lovely, the one, the only Mrs Parrish. We couldn't do without her. This was her conception and she's seen it through. It's a wonderful event. Um, so big round of applause. Um, if we could all unmute, but you're in charge, Mrs Parrish, we would. Thank you to you. Um, it's been a really wonderful evening and I do hope that all our paths will cross. Um, in many ways, actually doing it online has allowed us to, to reach so many more people. And I can see that some of you, I think, are still in work. Um, so hopefully you can now return home um, and have a very well earned rest. I can't imagine how busy you all are at the moment, but thank you for giving of your time. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks. Bye. Bye.